Welcome to the MSDW Podcast. I'm Jason Gumpert, editor at msdynamicsworld.com. On this episode, I am joined by David Ogilvie, an independent consultant who works in Australia and the surrounding region with companies selecting and deploying ERP solutions, oftentimes working with companies deploying Dynamics 365 Finance and Supply Chain and in previous version AX. As a business consultant, David's work focuses on business performance rather than technical capabilities. And as he explains in our conversation, he is a big believer in finding the right metrics to improve performance, but he also cautions against the unintended impact of measuring and incentivizing the wrong metrics. It can lead to unintended outcomes as we discuss. We also talk about David's observations on how the pandemic has impacted supply chains in his region and how businesses have adjusted in recent months. All right. Well, David Ogilvie, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining me today from uh, from Brisbane, Australia, right? Yes, Jason. And thanks very much for having me. Uh, yeah, glad glad to have you here. And uh, you know, I've I've had uh, I've been a subscriber to your um, to your sort of email list or your newsletter for quite a while, and uh, you always manage to find um, some interesting sort of sort of anchor point that you sort of base a lot of your thoughts around. Why don't you, can you just tell everyone, our, our listeners, um, sort of a little more of who you are and, and what some of your focus areas are? Sure, no problem. Um, I'm an individual solo consultant uh, operating out of Brisbane, Australia. My client base uh, covers uh, all of Australia, New Zealand, and I have clients in uh, Singapore and Vietnam. So I, I really uh, focus on the uh, Asia Pacific area, APAC really, or Pacific Rim. And I focus primarily with uh, manufacturing firms and distribution companies, so warehousing companies, transportation, and those sorts of uh, organisations. Uh, having said that, I have done a little bit of work in some government, and I also have done some work with um, some service organisations. So, you know, my skill set is broadly applied across many industries, but my key focus really is when I talk to clients. I, I bring the best value when they have an inventory as a major component of, of their business. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm an ex-supply chain consultant and, uh, and I bring value with um, uh, use of technology around improving profitability and so forth for businesses. So that's what I do best. And uh, you do quite a bit of work with companies that are running uh, either from as a legacy Dynamics AX based ERP or... Uh, nowadays, a, a Dynamics 365 solution, uh, oftentimes? That's correct. I, I am independent uh, when it comes to uh, to the ERP. That's that's quite a, a key component of my value proposition in many ways is, is my independence. But having said that, uh, because of the uh, the strengths of the products that Microsoft are developing, um, they are often uh, the winners of the selections that I run, and I have uh, helped implement and fine-tune uh, both AX and FinOps in many organizations. Great. Well, one of the things I was um, reading that you had written recently um, was just about, you know, something that I think is on every, a lot of people's minds, you know, adapting to today's economic conditions as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, it seems to be affecting different types of businesses differently, types of, you know, different regions differently. What's some of the advice that you are um, giving, or maybe what are some of the conversations that you're having with with clients, with businesses um, in your you know, part of the world that you work with um, in terms of how they're sure. trying to approach the, the challenges today? Sure. So the, the, key two, the, the two key areas really, I guess, Jason, are um, yesterday's strategy is not going to work for today and tomorrow. Uh, so a, a revisiting of, of uh, your strategic priorities and so forth uh, and your plans uh, is, is a key piece at the moment. And uh, amongst um, the client base that I've got, those that are innovating are ones that are really making the best, um, op finding the best opportunities out of the current circumstances. So they're the two really key components for me is, is uh, strategy at the moment, so revisiting strategies mm -hmm. and to, to look at how we can, can uh, get the business to innovate um, in the current climate now, some of that uses uh, technology and some of it doesn't. So it, it'll depend, but they're the two key prime driving pieces that I talk to clients about. That makes sense. I, I would imagine that companies that already had a, a mindset for, um, you know, being more dynamic, being um, enabling their workers to work in more innovative ways or to come up with new ways of doing things um, on a regular basis would have been, would be better positioned today to adapt. And I guess that would also kind of 
tie back to sort of the age and the flexibility of their of their systems. Well, that's that's quite right, and um, you know the coronavirus has definitely uh, put many organisations into a position where they needed to do this rapidly. Um, some were well positioned for that, some struggled with that. Um, I think Microsoft did a great job of of releasing Teams at the right time mm-hmm. um, because yeah. it, it has clear, clearly been able to scale, help a lot of companies scale in a very short period of time um, to, to cater for the for the work from home and so forth. Um, but um, yeah, it's uh, it's 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 been been an interesting time. Any particular examples that that jump out to you of um, you know, things organizations have had to do quickly that you've seen to really you know, not get swallowed up by some of the changes? Well, those that were on a cloud environment uh, that, that had that transferred to a cloud environment uh, early in the piece um, clearly didn't have as much difficulty um, changing as, as some of the others. Uh, but some of my clients obviously still had a lot of on-premise and legacy systems, and there were some serious work uh, go- gone into getting them across um to be able to give their, their their people access, particularly from a security perspective, Jason. Um, now, bear in mind, I'm not a I'm not a technology guy as such. I'm more of a businessman. Again, that's one of my my differentiators in in the marketplace. In many ways, I don't come to these projects from a from a technology um, uh, expert pers- perspective. I come from a business perspective. So, so you know, my CIOs that I work with uh, know much more about the technology they need to deploy than I do. Um, but you know there were some of them that were struggling with the security and, and getting ac- people access to their their, their legacy ERP systems um, in the new environment, and they had to do that quickly. One of the impacts, I guess you would say, in that, that I've just seen, you know, locally here in, in the U.S. was you know there was a, a there was a massive drop off in jobs, uh, employment, you know, millions of people laid off yeah. in a very short amount of time. Some of that has come back, but there's still, you know, a little under a million unemployment claims a, a, a week right now uh, in, in the US, I think, you know, in the 800,000 range. You know, all of that's part of cost cutting. You talk about cost cutting as one of the ways that obviously businesses are, for, are really forced to um, to make some kind of a change. I don't know, Have you? what, what are some examples of, of the decisions that you've seen uh, organizations making perhaps in your region? Well, uh, I think we've experienced uh, something very similar. Although I don't think Australia has um, ha- uh, quite had the difficulty that uh, that the US has with in, in regards to COVID, but um, certainly there's a lot of companies um, have have downsized their staff and 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 put them on furloughed uh, arrangements uh, fairly quickly. In fact, one of my uh, bigger projects that I was running um, came to a, f- a very quick standstill when, uh, when COVID, uh, really, really hit in, in March and they just, um, you know, closed everything down. So, um, having said that, there are a lot of businesses here in Australia that have done very well, uh, in the COVID, um, as a result because they, um, were able to pivot. Uh, they're able to be, uh, innovative. For, uh, for example, there's a, a number of, uh, small breweries and distilleries uh, around where I live, and those organisations very quickly turned themselves to into hand sanitizer manufacturers, and uh, that's created a, a very good market for them, and they they've actually done very very well. So um, it's been a really mixed bag uh, for different businesses, and it, and it gets back to that innovation piece that I mentioned right up front. It's it's really important for. For businesses to be able to innovate, um, so rather than just um, focus on 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 bedding down and, and hiding in a cave and cutting costs, you know those those companies that have done well have looked for opportunities and made investments in in, in areas rather than just simply cost cut. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know it, that's been a really key piece to their to their making the most of the of the current circumstance. Just in regard to how businesses have coped, I mean, have you seen um, sort of the nature of the services you're providing change or companies asking you different questions uh, than they were? Or has it, as, as companies have adapted, have things kind of gone, gone back to business as normal in a, in a sense? So the short answer to your question is yes, uh, the, the type of advice I'm being asked for has changed. Um, again, I, I mentioned earlier about strategy. I think everybody's realised that their strategic directions uh, needed to, to be revisited. So I'm doing um, uh, much more strategy work just at the moment. But it has also highlighted to many organisations um, 
how poor their systems actually were and how much um, uh, process inefficiency was being covered by having so many people in the organisations and how much these people were actually doing to cover shortcomings in their systems. And that has resulted in a fairly large uh, uptick in organisations reaching out for help with selecting new systems. Mm. So you know, I'm really busy at the moment doing a lot of selection work um, as opposed to implementation work because these organisations have, have, have realised how inefficient uh, their their current practices are. So yes, it has changed. Yeah. What are some of the things that they most sorely need uh, in a new system? Or is it just very different? I, sure, I assume it's actually quite different for each company to some extent. Uh, yes, it is. But there, there are some commonalities. And, and in many ways, um, and this gets back to, to one of the reasons why ERP has such a bad name in many respects too, but these organizations are looking for an ability to control process behavior, you know, the behavior within the business. And so, uh, the, you know, systems can help with, 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 with uh, controlling the way that, that, that the behavior in the business performs. Uh, and that gets back to one of the other topics that I thought we were going to talk about a little bit later around metrics and so forth, because, you know, uh, metrics are, um, are really should be based on the behavior that you want to instill in the business. Uh, and that's what they're looking for. They're looking for for process control. They're looking for behavior control, uh, and in in an efficient manner. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit more about about that. I know you've you've written about this to some to some extent. You obviously deal with it with your clients. What are some of those uh, metrics that are top of mind? Well, the big key one that I I, I talk to my clients about a lot is a is a, a metric called uh, EVA, which stands for Economic Value Added. It really is a measure of of measure of how much value is being added to the business. So how much more valuable is the business this month than it was last month? Um, there are many organizations that have uh, rapidly growing revenues. However, they're eating into the value of the business and the business is, is, is actually worth less 12 months now than it was 12 months ago, even though the revenues have been growing. So mm -hmm. it's a very important measure to identify what value is being added to the business. Now, not a lot of businesses use EVA, but it is one that I, I, I uh, try and, and uh, instill in my, in my clients where, where, where they're prepared to take it on. But there's a whole heap of uh, different um, swag of uh, metrics around, mm -hmm. and depending on, the, on your business type, you know, whether, whether it's DIFOT, for example, uh, that's a fairly regular um, measure that's used in both manufacturing and warehousing and so forth. Uh, delivery in full on time, obviously. Um, but it's about how you calculate these things too. And what is the, the real picture that you're, you're trying to get across? Because, you know, one company's die fight may be different to another, depending on whether they're, they're measuring it at a, at a, at a, at a header level, you know, a, a, a purchase order or sales order header level, or whether it's at a line level. Um, these things can paint different pictures. The big problem, I guess, the big message for me around metrics is that they come with unexpected consequences. And I think these are clearly articulated when you look at um, situations like Wells Fargo in America, right, where you had all of those um, uh, staff in Wells Fargo opening all of these fictitious accounts for people, all because they were being measured on how many new accounts and, and so forth that they were opening. And they were getting this unexpected behaviour in, in the staff um, based on, on the measure that they were using. We had a very similar situation here in Australia. Our, our banks and, um, and superannuation funds, for example, um, were actually charging people for services that they were not delivering. Uh -huh. And this, this was purely because it was all metric driven and they didn't take account for the unexpected behavior of those, of those metrics. So when I talk to my clients about the, the metrics that we're going to use uh, in the business, it's, it's all about identifying what behavior we want to occur in the business first and then work it back, how we're going to calculate that, how we're going to measure that and create the measure based on the behavior we're looking to achieve. Another um, case that you highlighted uh, recently that I think, I think came from the press um, and I think it was Australia was Freedom Foods, um, and they were doing yes. some some really crazy stuff with uh, inventory purchasing. Right? Was that related to metrics, uh, or was that more? Well, I don't, I don't know. That, 
to be, to be frank, I don't know the, the, the full details of that particular case to that level about what metrics they were using, but it, I would be highly, uh, I would suspect that that was the case. Uh, so, so the quick, for, 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 you, for your audience, the quick um, story around there was as, a, as an AXS listed uh, company in Australia called Freedom Foods, ASX listed uh, for your American viewers are um, listeners are um, is basically publicly listed, and um, they wrote off uh, sixty million dollars worth of, of of inventory that was out of out of date and um, out of um, yeah basically out of date. So they had uh, cereals and uh, UHT milk and all those sorts of things, and they just could not use the product because it was out of date. And, they, said, and yeah. they had to destroy it. Yeah. And it was $60 million worth. And so that cost the CFO, the CEO, uh, their jobs. The, the key um, point of my article really was that um, I am constantly gobsmacked by the amount of businesses that fail to do business 101. Now, in inventory mm-hmm. management, it's business 101. But there are so many companies out there who don't have good inventory management practices. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. I mean, I've I've been hearing you know I've been hearing people ham- hammer on that point for over a decade. I'm sure people have been talking about it for way longer than that, and it just never seems to go away because it's it's one of those <laughs> things that not everyone appreciates or is able able to execute on for some reason. Well, and and it get, again, it gets that's why I said I suspect it was about um um I suspect it was about the metrics they were using because mm-hmm. if you had the right metrics in place, you would know that these things are going on. Yeah, I guess you wrote in that in this particular case, at least one detail was that they were all using a single credit card, person maybe a personal credit card of one executive to do all the purchases. Oh, yeah, that's the other thing. Yeah, <laughs> which is a pretty odd, uh, a pretty odd behavior. Um, you know, one of the things from I don't know if you've been able to catch this week um, the Ignite virtual event from Microsoft, but one of the one of the sort of innovations that they've been really plugging for the for Dynamics three sixty five supply chain management is new inventory tools. And specifically, sort of a microservice to bring inventory data in from partners, from from vendors, I, I assume primarily, um, and uh, perhaps from you know perhaps from other kinds of partners too, to kind of give a more holistic picture of inventory as it relates to you know end customer needs or other needs. Um, I thought that was pretty interesting, but to me, that seemed like a really a next level uh, kind of capability for cr- companies that really have a, a really tight control of their exist of the sort of like you said the basic inventory uh, practices. Well, it's it's interesting you say that. I, I'm not across the the specific details of that because I, I must must confess I did miss Ignite, so I don't know the full details of the, that particular release. But I will look at that. But the reality is, um, from a supply chain perspective, that collaboration and sharing of information, uh, particularly around you know demand forecasting and um, psyop sales and inventory and op- uh, operations planning processes, that sharing and, co- and collaboration around in- information is really really important. And and I think COVID's brought this to to light in many ways because we saw. And I'm sure this happened uh, in, in the US as well, where we had um, toilet paper out of stock and we had, you know, all of these supermarket items that were, were, were empty on the shelves. And, and the reality is that was purely and simply because the supply chain for those particular products was suffering from what's called the bullwhip effect. And the, and the best way to, to minimize the variability that comes from the bullwhip effect is improved visibility up and down the supply chain. And so if those tools are going to be able to help collaborate around those sorts of things, they are going to be quite powerful to use. Yeah. And those, those, I, I know that those challenges still continue in the US forever. And it's like all these unintended consequences of having a super efficient supply chain, but perhaps one that's lacking visibility. I was just hearing about, you know, the meat uh, supply chain is still way off in, in certain, certain segments. Um, where now meat meat prices have fallen because um, there's an oversupply, um, and I think like paper, like you mentioned, certain paper products are still not available in the sort of the normal way that they used to be um, that people expect at the consumer level. So yeah, I think these these uh, that bullwhip effect perhaps is still uh, still playing out to to a degree. Uh, you know, 
Yeah, well, and that's what happens because yeah, because because um, the, the the effect of the bullwhip effect is you know that you need you've got a massive spike in demand, so that so your supply you you ramp up your your, your manufacturing um, requirement. You then put more demand on your supplier, so they have to ramp it up. But then there's a, this this delay, mm-hmm. and then they have to do the same thing with their supplier, and it just follows all the way down down the supply chain. And then all of a sudden, when you finally caught up, it stops, and then it just dro- drops off a cliff. The uh, actually, as you as you talked there, the new one I just thought of, just based on kind of a national news piece I happened to catch today, was um, was dry ice um, with the talk of a, of a vaccine, you know, coming in the next who knows three six months, at least the first of first of them. Yes, with the temperature controls required, um, dry ice is going to be just in in huge demand. I think it's already in, in a shortage for for some reason. So uh, <laughs> perhaps that's a that's an area, a new, a new and interesting wrinkle. Well, and and, and it comes down to, to proper supply chain planning. Mm. Um, I'm not quite sure how it works in 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 the US, but I, I did a supply chain uh, risk assessment for the federal health department here in Australia probably ten years ago now, uh, and we did some scenario planning. And 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 it's it's those sorts of exercises where you need to make sure that you you've got a clear understanding of what the impacts of the different um, Industries are going to be uh, under certain scenarios, and uh, I'm I'm a little surprised, I must admit, to hear that that wasn't identified. Because if you if you'd done some serious scenario planning, that should have been identified some time ago. Because anything that needs temperature control like that, whether it's the refrigerant gas requirements or you know the the, the amount of um, chilled containers or all of that sort of stuff. That that should all be part of the supply chain planning program. Yeah, and this 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 article this uh, this it was a TV piece, so it didn't really paint the full <laughs> the full picture. Um, I think it showed uh, you know certain elements of the I guess it would be that same supply chain are ramping up with in terms of adding refrigeration and things like that, while others are are struggling. So we'll see. You know, well, and the supply chains are struggling at the moment in many ways because of. Um, of the push to reshore things because mm-hmm. of the way um, you know, the relationship with China is, for example, and the fact that uh, you know shipping uh, containers are short at the moment, and um, air freight um, slots are, are restricted because there's not as many planes in the air these days, and there's a whole series of of, of areas that you know the supply chain uh, managers really have to get their head across. Yeah, yeah. So this is where tools can help. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the one of the things I, I've sensed is that as as supply chains have sort of driven down the the time that they between the time a, a a purchase request is made and it's and the goods are delivered and so the next state step whatever, wherever that might be you know with like just just in time um, kinds of operations maybe that just doesn't work in in when you throw a real serious uh, aberration into the normal. Yeah. way of working. I, I wonder if that's going to force you know people forecasting on the risks of supply chains. I don't know if it's on the insurance side or, or where, but to say we can't, uh, you know, we can't build businesses and sort of finance in, in you know, purchasing inventory or whatever, if you're going to be doing it based on these super tight, no t- zero, almost no tolerance for error uh, approaches. So it's interesting you mentioned just in time because it, it, it's my belief that in many ways, a number of companies and quite a few Quite a large number of companies, I think, have have made poor use of the just in time um, philosophy. You know, you hear a lot of press around uh, just in time, meaning uh, no inventory. And the reality is, if you look at the the, the Japanese philosophy behind this, the Toyota production system, uh, just in time, I don't believe, has ever said no inventory. It has just it's all about removal of waste. So inventory, can, um, if it's not being used correctly, is wasteful, and that's why the focus is on reducing inventory. But it never says no inventory. It always says it having the right amount of inventory in the right place at the right time. And that's why within the JIT philosophy, there there is a concept called supermarkets, and that is where you you have a, a buffer of stock in certain parts of the supply chain to 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 buffer for these sorts of elements. Now. Nobody could have foreseen, foreseen the um, the level of uh, variability that COVID was going to bring. So I think that was inevitable that those sorts of shortages were going to have. But uh, I think what it has brought to light is is the poor use of the philosophy. 
And if and I think if it had been used correctly, then there could have been a different outcome. Yeah, interesting. I also want to just before I forget, I'm going to mention um, you have a, a nice in- infographic um, that you've created that, or you know, sort of a diagram that 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 sort of outlines the ten uh, inventory management uh, tools and, and, and th- th- that you tend to stress. And so we'll, we'll put a, either a, a copy of that image or maybe a link to it uh, in the notes for the show. But it is it is a handy uh, oh. a handy list there, nicely done. Yes, thank you. Does your work ever? I, I know you. So I, I mean, clearly, just from from what we've been talking about. Um, Inventory related uh, matters, uh, obviously a, a big part of what you do. That does trickle down to customer service. Do you end up um, sort of advising on sort of directly how, how that does impact customers? Well, absolutely, because at the end of the day, all of this is driven by customers. It, it all begins with customers. So when I, when I start work with a client, um, I always start at the customer end because at the end of the day, they're the ones that need to be satisfied. They're the ones that generate the profit. So that's where we've got to start. Mm. So everything we do is aimed at improving the customer experience. Now, whether that be a shift into, um, you know, the e-commerce world, um, if, if it's a retailer, for example, or whatever it happens to be, it's all about focusing on the customer and the customer experience. And I think you'll find, uh, I don't know whether it's a friend of mine coined the name or not, but the Amazon effect, of course, is that. Um, customers are starting to expect, have a higher expectation day after day. Mm -hmm. They are expecting things to be able to be delivered, you know, to be able to uh, uh, pick things very quickly, reasonably priced and delivered very quickly. And that's putting a lot of pressure on a lot of other organisations because you only got to look at the way Amazon works with their with their um, their automated uh, warehousing and all those, their whole supply chain uh, activity. And that's that's filtering down to other organisations and they have to compete. So yes, it's, it's putting a lot of pressure on the customer service and 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 where you sit in that in relation to to your competitors. I'm curious when it comes to sort of ERP competition in the kinds of businesses that you are working with. I know you said that D365 finance and supply chain management come into play a lot when that product is up for consideration. Or those products, I guess, are separate now officially. What are some of the other competitors out there that that tend to make it into those? into those shortlists in Australia or in, in the Pacific Rim? Well, sure. Uh, it depends on the size of the business, of course. But if, if you're looking at the top end of town, clearly uh, SAP and Oracle are, are large competitors. And that's why Microsoft, I think, originally bought uh, uh, AX off, uh, off of uh, DamGuard or Navision and um, have done all of the work that they've done to try and push uh, what is now the finance and supply chain or finance, FinOps, depending on which name they yeah. want to use today or tomorrow. They've been pushing that into the, the, the SAP and Oracle space to compete in the, at the enterprise level. So they're probably the other uh, two really big uh, gorillas in the market. Um, then there's the products, depending on, on which industry, like IFS, CISPRO, Epicor, um, Business Central gets a look. Um, you get things like QAD. And then there's um, Sage. You've got a number of different products that are in the marketplace. There's, there, there is a plethora of ERP systems to choose from if you wanted to. Mm. Plenty of competition, uh, plenty of choices. Abs- absolutely. And, and I guess that's uh, rightly or wrongly, and this is with all due respects to the many friends that I've got that are um, uh, software salespeople, ERP sales has a bad reputation when it comes to, um, uh, let's just start as it is, honesty. There, there, is, there are a lot of lies and, and, and um, uh, mistruths spoken in the, in the ERP sales process. So uh, there are a lot of landmines for people who don't know what they're doing that they can very quickly step into that they don't find out the problems until it's too late and it's too costly. So I'd like to think that's where my value comes in, having done this for over 20 years now, um, where I, I know where the landmines are and I can help guide them around those sorts of things when it comes to choosing a new system. Any, anything else you wanted to call out that you've really been paying attention to recently? Anything else that you've been writing about or planning to produce any new new works on uh, in, in the near future? Ah, that's... Um you caught me short on that one. I'm not quite sure. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always so, so. I talked about innovation before, and one of the things I'm trying to do is always, always innovate. Um, so I have been, um, I've been working on a on a tool uh, called the ERP uh, Success Formula. That's that's about to be released shortly. I've, as I think, as you know, I've already written my first book, 
and uh, I'm starting to, to work on my second. Um, so that's in, that's in the pipeline at the moment. So they're probably the two key ones that I'm, or three key ones that I'm working on. All right. Well, David, thank you so much for taking the time. It's great to catch up finally and, and, and uh, have this chance to, uh, to talk on the, on the podcast here. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being here. Jason, thank you for having me. This has been another episode of the MSDW podcast. My thanks to David Ogilvy for joining me. If you want more information on what David is up to, you can check out his website, davidogilvy.com.au. He's got his blog and other resources there. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, Jay Gumpert at msdynamicsworld.com. You can also follow us on Twitter or on LinkedIn. And uh, that's it for this time. Until next time, this is MS Dynamics World signing off.